You know, the fun part about businesses, and, and I, from my perspective, is no matter what business I've been in, there are always challenges, and it's how you embrace them. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, is how you're going to be successful. In it. The Industrial Sage Executive Series, sharing the stories behind game-changing executives, their organizations, and insights into today's industry challenges. Okay, well, welcome to today's episode of Industrial Sage with our executive series. I have the distinct pleasure of being here with Mr. Tim Vargo, who is the CEO of Exide Technologies. Tim, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thankful. Um, thankful to be here. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're excited to have you here. So for those who aren't familiar with Exide, um, mm -hmm. you know, can you just tell me a little bit from a 30,000 sure. foot view? Yeah. So Exide's one of the uh, one of the oldest uh, and largest battery manufacturers in the world. We began uh, manufacturing batteries in 1888. 1888. One of the very first companies to manufacture batteries, uh, and have served a variety of different markets uh, over the last 130 plus years. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, we have uh, our main uh, emphasis are in manufacturing in Europe, which is about two thirds of our revenue, and in North America. So uh, and uh, we ship. Uh, products uh, generally all over the world from either North America or Europe. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm excited to kind of dive into that a little bit more, sure. especially what batteries look like back in 1888. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, I just kind of want to get a little sense of of, of Tim, sure. of, of you, your story, mm -hmm. how you got to where you are. Mm -hmm. Take me back. What was, you know, sure. like, where did you go to school? Where yeah. did you, what was that first job? What did that look like? Sure. Well, I'm a boomer. So, uh, you know, my, my father served in World War II. Uh, my family is from uh, Eastern Europe, Hungarian. Mm. Uh, so I grew up in a in the Rust Belt in manufacturing. So family farmers came over from Europe, got manufacturing jobs in North America to to build a better life for them and their families. So uh, my aunts, uncles, and cousins uh, all worked in factories generally up in the Cleveland, Ohio area, from Detroit down through Pennsylvania. So uh, so I grew up in a in a just a good old fashioned Rust Belt town. A lot of manufacturing jobs, uh, and uh, so uh, having a good work ethic was expected. Mm, yeah. Um, uh, I watched my dad come home from work every day, not really having a good time at work, but it was a job, and yeah. he got it done, and he just never really had a whole lot of fun. Mm. And I was determined that whatever I did with my life, I was going to try to come home from work with a smile on my face and say, "Man, I just, I just love what I do." So, aspirationally, that's what I, mm. that's what I, that's what I wanted to do versus what I saw. My father and some of my uncles and some of my aunts who worked in, you know, long, long day manufacturing jobs uh, just didn't really appeal to me. What were they doing? Like, I mean, were they uh, so assembly work, okay, uh, yeah. you know, uh, punching out bits and parts, mm -hmm. uh, assembly at Ford Motor Company, GM, building engines, uh, building pumps, mm -hmm. you know, all the little things that uh, that the Rust Belt is known for. Real great industrial manufacturing. OK, so uh, so, you know, I was uh Pretty industrious young guy. I yeah. uh, started raking leaves early, shovel, shovel snow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when I got old enough, I uh, our family was did hunting and fishing, and so uh, my brother uh, was older than I was and had a trap route. Mm. So I was trapping muskrat and uh, mink. Awesome. Uh, when I was probably 11 years old. That's pretty cool. Yeah, walking yeah. to a creek, uh, setting traps, uh, doing that, bringing the game home, skinning them, and selling the pelts. That's awesome. Uh, so that was my winter job since I couldn't rake leaves and there wasn't really that much snow to shovel. Yeah. Uh, had a job in a kennel, cleaning kennels as a young guy, maybe 13 years old. Had an office cleaning job, you know. So uh, I learned to work hard. Mm -hmm. I learned to be uh, responsible for showing up to work on time at a young age. I got that from my dad, you know. My dad was up every morning at 5, left the house at 6, came home at 5, 5.30. So, you know, that's, that's what you do. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, I did those things and uh, graduated from high school, had aspirations to go to college. Uh, my dad said, great, you go ahead, but you can pay for it because, you know, we don't go to college here. We, you know, we go to the factory at work. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So I uh, attended Kent State University in the fall of 69. Not a good mm -hmm. time to go to college. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Spent uh, my first semester there of my good hard-earned money, not meeting one professor. They were all out protesting the war. <laughs> So I quit college, put a backpack on my back, and hitchhiked to Florida. To Florida? Oh, yep. okay. Yep. The store in uh, Dickens. Worked on construction mm -hmm. and uh, made a pretty good living down there for about six months. Got really lonely, kind of missed my home, missed my mm -hmm. family. Uh, drove in my 1950 Cadillac. <laughs> yeah. 
from Florida to Ohio, and uh, my dad said, boy, welcome back, son. Uh, get a haircut tomorrow and get a job. <laughs> so I said, thanks, Dad. Good seeing you after six months. And so, uh, by golly, I got a haircut and got a job as a uh, manager trainee in an auto parts chain. Mm -hmm. Now, my father loved cars, and, and much like, uh, you know, any kid, uh, male or female, what your parents like, you know, you're usually kind of attracted to. Mm -hmm. So I love cars. And so, boy, here's an opportunity to go to work for an auto parts company at age 19 years old as a manager trainee. Wow. And so, boy, I really loved it. Uh, got paid $56 a week for 56 hours of work after tax. All right. My dad said, you're crazy. Come to the factory and work <laughs> with me. I said, you know what? I come home smiling. You don't. Mm. And mm. so one thing led to another. I made the assistant manager's job, got to manage my own store, took the worst store to the best store, really found a way to get work done through other people in an enthusiastic way, made sure I had the right butts in the right seat. Yeah. Uh, ended up getting multi-unit responsibility, did pretty good there, then kept growing, eventually became the executive vice president of a family-owned business, not mine, mm -hmm. somebody else's, learned from some great mentors and uh, how to purchase product and how to serve customers and just really learned a lot. And uh, then I had an opportunity to join a company by the name of AutoShack, mm -hmm. which uh, became AutoZone in 1984. Mm -hmm. So I joined them as, a, as an executive uh, at age 34, Wow. running uh, half the stores. Uh, within a couple of years, I was running all of supply chain, eventually became the president chief operating officer and watched the company grow from virtually nothing to 3,000 stores and $5 billion in revenue. Uh, that was over 84 to 2001. And uh, today that company has uh, 80,000 employees, 6,000 stores, and does about $11 billion in revenue. So... My heart's, in, uh, my heart's in retail, my heart's yeah. in distribution. Uh, I believe in being a servant leader, and uh, mm -hmm. I like to surround myself with people who, who share that passion to do that. Uh, took a couple years off. You know, when you're running that hard, a little vacation is good now and then. Don't get a chance for, for much of that uh, yeah. with that go-go of a company. Right. Uh, served on a couple of boards of directors when I was fairly young, in mm -hmm. my 40s. Uh, didn't really, wasn't really a good fit for me. I wanted to actually get stuff done. <laughs> yeah. So I ended up getting back in the workforce, uh, ran a heavy-duty truck parts distributor for a couple of years in the real downturn years of 8, 9, and 10. Mm -hmm. So I learned uh, I'd been used to this kind of growth. I hadn't been used to uh, running ever running a business that declined. Mm -hmm. We declined 30% in one year wow. when the downturn. Yeah. Managed to turn that around. Uh, it was a private equity-owned business. They had another business they wanted me to run, so I then ran a uh, a uh, commercial HVAC parts distribution company. Mm -hmm. So more distribution, just a different segment. Yeah. Um, retired again uh, <laughs> at age 60, pick a number, four or five, something like that, six. And uh, served on a couple of boards, mm -hmm. Exide being one of them. All right. And uh, lo and behold, they said, listen, we're, we need a little help here. Mm -hmm. Would you consider running this company? And I went, absolutely, let's go. Awesome. So uh, I've learned I don't do retirement well, <laughs> uh, and I really like working with uh, people who want to be successful and are driven and are passionate about the, the work that they do and the customers they serve. That's so. awesome. What a great, what a great yeah. story. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things there that I, I love, you know, the, obviously a strong work ethic, mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that story of smiling, coming mm -hmm. home and smiling, I'll, oh, yeah. I'll get into that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. I have a, it gives me a great follow-up question later. Um, Throughout your journey, where who, where were you know some people who mm -hmm. helped to really influence that sure. you know that to create some of those milestone mm -hmm. moments or you know, mentors yeah. or, or you know what did that look like? Well, you know, my first store manager uh, had just come out of the army in 1970, uh, which is when I started working the auto parts company, and uh, and he was a guy a few years older than me, but he had a he had a passion for customer service. Uh, I don't I don't know where he got it from, but he. Hmm. He shared it with me. He taught me how to, how to embrace solving customer problems, uh, how to do it with a smile on my face, how to be inquisitive, how to always try to learn. Uh, and so I was very blessed to have a, a mentor like that for my first few years in business. And so that's how I thought you were supposed to do it. And so I learned how to do that, and that worked pretty well for mm. me through the years. So I would say that, that Bill Sula is the guy's name. He's still a friend today. And... Uh, and uh, had a really strong influence on me. And I, and I was blessed to have other leaders along the way who in that family business shared kind of the family principles. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we kind of ran our business. And so 
through the years, I've certainly been involved in businesses who, who I could see weren't led like that mm -hmm. and the results that they got. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and rarely are they ever as good as a business kind of run the other way. So awesome. had a strong influence on me. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so today now, you mentioned you know, the, this, this story or this idea of going to work and mm -hmm. coming back with a smile on your face. Yeah. Today, what is that for you? What, what, help, what motivates you to get out of bed, super excited, and come home with that smile on your face? Well, you know, Exide uh, is a great company. It's been around 130 years. It, it, has, it has grown. It was the largest battery manufacturer in the world back at uh, the, the turn of the latest century, uh, 2000. Uh, <laughs> fell into some hard times, had some leadership issues, some financial issues, kind of overextended their reach and growing too fast, and, and then a downturn, and then maybe some mismanagement. So we've had a, we've had a pretty bumpy road since uh, kind of 2006, 7, 8, 9. And so the company's gone through a lot of turmoil, uh, shrunk in size, which mm -hmm. is not unusual for a company that's having problems. And so uh, joining the board of the company, seeing the enthusiasm that the people had in spite of the challenges, um, I, I felt like this was going to be one of those ones where you just needed to harvest the energy of the people who were there and make sure we were directed in the right way in order to solve our own problems while solving the customer's problems. So it was pretty easy for me to come to work kind of being myself mm -hmm. and, uh, and then motivating the people around me to come in with that same kind of attitude, even though many of them had been through some really tough times. Yeah. Um, you know, we had, we had uh, hired some really good people from other industries to kind of fill some slots based on the fact that we lost some really good people in the downturn of our business. Mm -hmm. And so we had a really nice blend of people who'd been in successful businesses and knew how to do that, uh, trying to motivate and encourage our folks who had gone through some tough times to kind of mm -hmm. pick themselves up by the bootstraps and look at the glass half full instead of half empty. Mm -hmm. so. so it sounds like uh, what I'm hearing is culture. Absolutely very culture. very big yeah. uh, emphasis on culture. Yeah. And speak the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, we, our company, I think, uh, for for several years, really kind of hid from the truth. Mm. We didn't face up to the fact mm. to our employees, yeah, we've had tough times, but here's our path to success. And uh, with the help of our communications team and our leadership team, we were able to jump in there and as a leadership team, talk about where we've been, where we're going and how we're gonna get there, kind of paint a picture of what success looks like. Right, yeah. And then put the, put the cornerstones in place to get there. So that's been the path we've been on now for almost a year and a half. And uh, we've, we've had some really good successes, and I think our, now our employees around the globe can see where we're going, and they can see we're making progress in getting there. And our customers have been very welcoming and very supportive. So that's, that's awesome. helpful, too. Very loyal customer base. That's awesome. Yeah. So let's pivot a little bit now. Let's talk about maybe things that don't necessarily, maybe might not put a smile on your face, but okay. maybe they do. Um, and that's some of the challenges the industry is facing. Yeah. Um, that, that maybe just goes beyond Exide, but just the industry mm -hmm. in general. What are some of those challenges that you're seeing um, in, in the industry? Well, you know, um, obviously we're in, the, we're in the battery manufacturing business, so we're manufacturing batteries for cars, for trucks, for uh, any, any kind of transportation piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also do standby power, which is how we got in the business in the first place back in 1888. Uh, standby power today would be uh, harvesting solar energy and storing it in a battery, for example, uh, doing backup power for data centers and that sort of thing. And then, of course, what we call motive power, which is forklifts. And then we have a variety of different solutions for the military. Almost all include uh, things that aren't necessarily environmentally friendly, yeah. that for years and years and years, people didn't recognize as environmentally, um, uh, as not environmentally friendly. So lead, lead and acid are, are, are things that make a battery click. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't take care of the leftovers, you're going to have a problem. And for yeah. years, our industry did not do that. And I mean for years. So if you went back into the uh, early uh, first century in England, they were mining lead. Mm -hmm. They were pounding lead out with open kettles, mm -hmm. and they were making roofs and utensils and all kinds of things out of lead, mm -hmm. and then eating out of it. And so, consequently, people were dying of lead poisoning, yeah. but they didn't know. Yeah, you really had to go into the kind of the middle of the 20th century before we finally realized that lead was a problem. And so, unfortunately, our industry has a lot of baggage around lead. Sure. Now listen, it's, our industry's done a great job. We recycle in the transportation space 
if there are roughly 70 or 80,000 batteries manufactured in North America, we, we recycle all the lead, all the acid, all the chemicals, and the plastic from those mm. at almost 100%. Wow. So it's a fantastic story to tell yeah. that's not told, told often enough. Mm. Uh, same thing in Europe. Europe has a great recycling history as well. So the challenges in our business is that, um, you know, everybody's always looking for the easy solution. And so lithium has come on board here over the last decade or so. Uh, people were saying lead acid is dead. Lithium is the solution. Kind of forgot lithium's got a lot of stuff in it that people don't <laughs> like either. And is it good for the environment? And oh, by the way, it's not something that's completely recyclable yet mm. and may never be. Really? And so, um, so we're, we're dealing with a couple of things. We, we do lithium today. We buy lithium cells. We assemble them, provide solutions for a variety of different uh, uh, energy needs from uh, uh, backup power to motive power for forklifts and that sort of thing. But, but it's, it's a complicated problem because the, the industry isn't old enough yet to have developed the full mm -hmm. recyclability. Mm -hmm. So we've got we've to be good stewards of that product as well. So... And that's, that's exciting. So yeah. we've got the old technology, yeah. which now people are investing in and in trying to make it better, cheaper, uh, continue the sustainability while providing better solutions for uh, what people are using lithium for today can lead acid be a substitute for that in the future. So even though it's 130, 140 year old, 40 year old technology, mm -hmm. new, tech, new solutions are being developed today out of this old uh, mineral called lead, yeah. okay? It comes out of the ground and uh, and provides great energy storage. Energy storage is going to be in everybody's lifetime who's watching this, mm. and we just have to figure out how to provide the most efficient solution yeah. at the best cost and have it be sustainable at the same time. How could you not be more excited about that? You know, it doesn't matter whether it's car batteries, truck batteries, stationary power, whatever it is. So, mm. yeah. Um, you know, well, it's it's so interesting just to see, and I imagine, obviously, you've seen just a, a huge shift. And mm -hmm. um, just looking at just from as, let's say, in the automotive space, for example, you know, this big, you know, push, the Teslas of the mm -hmm. world going more, you know, electric, mm -hmm. which has mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a, a big, you know, battery. The power is mm -hmm. kind of a big deal with that. Or you yep. look at... It is a big deal. Talking yeah. about drones and mm -hmm. Amazon talking about how mm -hmm. now we want to, you know, flood, yeah. which... You know, having uh, operated a few drones and stuff in the past, mm -hmm. I mean, you've seen over the last several years, like the, the efficiency, just it, it's, it's getting, mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing. Yeah. But I can imagine, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. a lot of hurdles there. Mm -hmm. they, we've got to make this better, yep. faster, cheaper. Yep. And by the way, we need to be nice to the environment. Yep, that's right. <laughs> yep. So you have a big challenge on your, on your of hands. Of course. You know, er, you know, the fun part about businesses, and, and I, from my perspective, is no matter what business I've been in, there are always challenges. And it's how you embrace them. Uh, in my opinion, is how are you going to be successful or not? You can't walk around and say, woe is me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we've got this really tough time. You know, right. Car sales are down, so battery sales are down. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. Get over that. Yeah. Find the solutions. Generate mm -hmm. the business. You know, uh, Have deep relationships with your customers. Provide better solutions than your competitors do. Yeah. You know, That's one of the things that drives American business so well is we're very competitive around the world. Yep. And we set the standards for efficiency, productivity, um, yep. Return on invested capital. That's why the U.S. markets are so hot today. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. manufacturing is outstanding. So, yeah. well, competition helps drive innovation. So Absolutely. You don't yep. have competitors. You won't have innovation. Well, lithium is helping the lead acid battery manufacturers become more innovative. Mm. And so we're we know for a fact that we're going to be providing solutions in the future that we weren't able to do today because, like most businesses, you go through investment cycles. And, and the lead acid battery business has been kind of stagnant in the investment cycle for a long time. Now there's a lot of enthusiasm around it because the, the challenges of lithium are now coming to the forefront. And so it's forcing more investment in that tried and true uh, uh, power storage of lead acid mm -hmm. um, to take that next jump in technology too. So yeah. uh, it's real exciting to be a part of that. Absolutely. So. Um We've got a, a large show coming up, so we've got mm -hmm. Modex, yeah. um, and I, I think you guys are going to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you have? New technology or innovations yeah. that you're that you're rolling out with there that you can share? Well, so that obviously this is for the for the uh, forklift power business, mm -hmm. forklift business, and we're a, a key supplier in that in that industry and have been for a long, long time with our GNB brand. Um, 
And so uh, we did a really key acquisition a few years ago with a, a small company in South Carolina called Acre Wade. And uh, they provide some outstanding uh, charging systems that actually monitor the battery usage for large users of forklifts. And it's a very intelligent system. Uh, so we've been able to integrate that into our battery technology. And so we'll be demonstrating there at Modex um, uh, the technology that we're bringing to the marketplace and how we can study the usage of mm. our customers' products and where they're actually in use, uh, monitor their performance, let them know when they can be charged, and all that is available in the cloud so they can look at it real time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're pretty excited about that, and I think we've got a number of things that are leading the way in our industry, uh, which is pretty good for a you know 130-year-old company to be innovative and leading the way in certain things. So, I'd say you know? so. I mean, you have to be. And that's that, that's the big story right now there mm -hmm. is making, you know, well, to, to, to dumb it down, smart products mm -hmm. or, yeah. you know, leveraging IoT yeah. and, yep. you know, the, 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 to, to bet, you know, to take more data and be mm -hmm. able to see what the story tells. You know, yep. somebody was telling me that, I was reading a report there saying that um, actually manufacturing, and we can lump in, you know, logistics and supply mm -hmm. chain, all that, is uh, actually one of the most data prolific, if not the oh. Oh. most data prolific, um, uh, industry yep. out there at all. Absolutely. So um, it, it's, uh, I thought that was interesting. I thought mm -hmm. about it for two seconds. Well, mm -hmm. think about all the, the processes and everything that's going on. Yeah. So um, that's, that's very exciting. So um, that's, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of it. That's what I've got yeah. well, that's for great. today. Um, I really, I really enjoyed hearing your story. I really enjoyed hearing your background. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think one of the big takeaways that I have um, is just the, 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 this concept of a, your work ethic, mm -hmm. um, in, in, like interjecting that into the culture, uh, and this notion of coming home smiling, mm -hmm. yeah, making sure that you know, there's a passion and that, that you are plugging yourself into an area that you you come back. And I know that all days, yeah. you know, I'm sure you got your non-smiling days, right? Yeah, well, not too many, well, but yeah. You know what's interesting to me is you know uh, now that I'm old enough to remember people saying that when I was young the work ethic had had gone down the drain and mm -hmm. we didn't have the same work ethic, and I. <laughs> I've been around long enough to hear that for, <laughs> for my kids and now my grandkids. And uh, what I would tell you is, is we, we find a great workforce out there today. Mm. Uh, they're, 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 they're easily motivated, providing your, your, you are giving them reasons to work from where they like to work and how they like to work. Yeah. And so challenge for old guys like me is to try to figure out how you can uh, make sure you're providing a work environment for today's employees. Yeah. Uh, differently than we had in the past. Yeah. And I think our company's doing a really good job of that. So that's awesome. Happy to be a part that, of that too. So excellent. Well, no lack of challenges. No, no. But that's no. um but it sounds like you guys are tackling them head yeah. on and uh in, in a great way. Great. Thank you so much for for, for coming on. And if anyone would like to uh, check out more about you guys, I'm sure they can check you out online. Yep. Xi.com. You bet. Xi.technologies.com. Yeah. Perfect. We're there. Excellent. Well thank you, great. Tim. Thank you. All right, well, that wraps up our uh, interview here with Tim Fargo, the CEO of Exide Technologies. Uh, listen, I'm, we've been rolling out with these stores, the executive series. It's uh, fairly new, uh, and I tell you what, I'm really, really enjoying this, hearing all the, the different stories and the backgrounds, just to getting an, an, an understanding of uh, you know, how uh, the, the influence of your background in these different stores are influencing today's executives and going into you know, the different companies. Um, it's been, uh, it, I'm excited about it. So get really excited about it. We're going to have more coming down the tracks. Uh, a lot more executives are going to be coming and we're hearing their stories. If there's something in particular you'd love to hear about, reach out to us. Uh, you can submit a question to us at industrialsage.com forward slash questions. We'll take that feedback in and uh, put it into the show. So that's all I got for you today. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you're on any of the podcasting stations, I'm Danny Gonzalez. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next week here at Industrial Sage. Industrial Sage is an open platform where companies can showcase their expertise and solutions to a captive audience of industrial professionals. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and while you're there, please leave us a review. Want us to tell your story? Go to industrialsage.com. This week's episode was produced by Rika Wiersma, filming by Donovan Jones, editing by Rika Wiersma, music composed by Oliver Michael, and executive producers Danny Gonzalez and David Karen. This is the Industrial Sage Executive Series.